Good. Thanks, Tim. Lord, it feels like um, words are not enough to say thanks. How do we express it more deeply? You have done so much for us. There have been so many miracles. So many people who are, Lord, fighting for us. And I guess even said better than that, fighting for you and for your cause. This is your plan. This is your development. And we bless you. We say thank you for Graycore. We say thank you for Martin and David as consultants. We say thank you for Lisa Helps from the province who has been, Lord, working on our behalf and so caring and gracious to us. We say thanks for this announcement that happened on Monday and all that will come as a result. At the same time, Lord, we can't help but say we're a little bit afraid, we're a little bit hesitant, we're a little bit uncertain. Lord, give us faith in our, in our, uh, in our lack of faith at times. Give us protection as we move forward, believing that you called us to this, but knowing of all of the opposition that has already started to come. So, Lord, we trust you. <clears throat> We're afraid at times, Lord, that something will happen that will just sort of knock this off kilter, but, oh, Lord, you're bigger than all that. And so we bless you and praise you and give ourselves to you in the midst of this project. Just say thanks for all you've done and will do in the future. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen. <clears throat> I'm starting in Jude, cha Jude verse 11. Here's what it says. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. What is the way of Cain? And if there is such a thing, how do we avoid also walking in the way of Cain? Well, let me back up all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And this is week one in the story, and we're going to look at Genesis 1 through 11 in the course of our week together. If you read the book by Licato and Frazee, you'll see that Genesis 1 through 11 is a, a sort of a chunk of scripture that, well, it's the beginnings, it's roots, it's our heritage, our origins. And we know that in this chapter, in these chapters 1 through 11, that God creates all things. He speaks and all of creation is fashioned. We as human beings as the crown jewel. He creates out of love and he wants relationship with us, not a bunch of servants like all of the other creation stories. Chapters 1 and 2, we see the beauty not only of creation, but of this relationship between God and his people. The story of God. This is what life should be like. And then we get to chapter 3. And another story is introduced. A story by which mankind tells God what he can do with his story because they fashioned another. We see this a number of times in these chapters. Adam and Eve in chapter 3, we know the story. Mankind separated from God. Cain and Abel in chapter 4, we see the first family fail. Humanity is not only at odds with God, but at odds with each other. Chapter 6 and on, Noah and the ark. Wickedness of culture sort of overleaps itself, and we see the failure of culture. Chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Technology comes on the scene. Engineering, they build a tower higher and higher, somehow thinking that they can get to God and become like God. And we see failure again. Living into a different story. Four times in 11 chapters. If you've read chapters 1 through 11 before, not even just this week, 
you're left with a million and one questions, aren't you? Here's a couple that I got from this week. Who did Cain marry? What supernatural beings came and married human beings? Why is that part of the story in chapter 6? How did the animals actually go into the boat? Like you can imagine sort of a rhinoceros next to a giraffe for all those months. And were those who created the Tower of Babel, were they actually serious? Did they actually think they could build a tower all the way to the sky? There's so many questions in these first chapters. But there's one thing that we have to know all the way through. It's about two stories. One that was God's and one that was ours. Or, as said in Jude 11, the way of Cain. So I chose this morning to dive a little bit more deeply into chapter 4 and this story of Cain and Abel. We're probably familiar with it, but I have to admit there were some new things that I discovered this week that pressed hard on me and some of the ways that I live. So come with me to chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And we start right at the beginning. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant, gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. There's blessing. Eve, part of Adam and Eve who had uh, done the first sin and told God what he could do with his plan, even now she's blessed and she recognizes it. There's joy. Two babies are born and Eve gives credit to God. It's his agency. It's his creativity that that brings forth these two men. But she got to participate, and she's rejoicing, as we all do when babies are born. But we come to verse 3, and the story quickly unravels. Listen to verses 3 to 5, and I'll make some comments about this as the story intensifies. Now Abel kept flocks. Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his, his offering, he did not look with favor. They've made some decisions. Cain's going to be a farmer like his dad. Abel becomes a shepherd. That's their vocation. Okay, so far so good. They both decide to bring offerings. The word that's used here in the scripture is the same for both of them. They bring this offering of that which they've produced. Cain, fruits of the ground, Abel, fat portions, firstborn of his flock. Yet God really acted differently. To Abel, he was pleased. To Cain, he was not pleased. So you and I, as we read this, we can't help but stop and come to this point where we say, What's the difference? Why did God react differently? We begin to examine the text, and what do we see? Well, I have to promise you that all kinds of different commentators make different comments. One says, well, it's obvious that Cain offered something that had no blood in it, meaning that he didn't give a good depiction of the atonement when Jesus would come and shed his blood. But you'll notice in the text that neither did Abel. He gave the fat portions. It doesn't say anything about blood. So this isn't, this isn't the answer. Somebody else said, well, Abel brought his first fruits. And admittedly, there might be something there. But we're not sure. We're not really convinced. Uh, one other commentator, how about this one? Abel, Abel, when he offered his gift, the smoke went up. But when Cain offered his gift, the smoke went down. You see that? I don't. <laughs> it's nothing to do with the story. We don't even know that it was a burnt offering. One of the best comments was this. Why do we keep trying to read in between the lines instead of just reading the lines? This story doesn't really tell us the difference. It's not as concerned with the difference between their offerings as it is with the conversation between Cain and God. Now, however, 
even though Genesis doesn't tell us, we have to look at all of Scripture. And if you thumb ahead to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 11, verse 4, here's what that says. Because Abel had faith, he offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. God was pleased with him and his gift. And even though Abel is now dead, his faith still speaks for him. What do we know from these verses in Genesis? We know that there was something different. What do we know from all of Scripture? It's likely that somehow there was a different attitude, there was a different approach in Abel than there was in Cain. Or can I say it a different way? I think they were living in a different story. Abel was living in a story of faith where it was all about God, his glory, his agency. And Cain was living in a religious story where he came and did his duty, but nothing more. Well, we have to stop here for a minute and we have to ask the question of so what? So what for us? What does this teach us even about worship? Um, we started interns yesterday, and there were seven or eight of us that get together, and we're going to do so throughout the course of the year, and go deeply into some of the scriptures and deeply into our understanding of who God is. And one of the highlights for me yesterday was when a light bulb went off in one of the people that were attending. Oh, so worship is more than just what we do on Sunday morning. It's about our entire lives, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Worship is about this understanding that it's all about God as our king, and we bring gifts to him in everything that we do. See, one of the problems that's happened in the church in the West is we've reduced worship to an hour, hour and a half on Sunday morning. Instead of understanding that it's everything about our lives all week. We live into a story of worshiping a king, not just on Sunday morning, but at every hour of the day, every day of the week. We don't just go to church to get something out of it. We don't just go to church to do the religious thing, giving sort of the bare minimum standard. We live in the way of Abel putting everything into it, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, learning to trust, learning to have faith. I prayed earlier about something I was bringing, and I said I was bringing a confession. Here's what it was. I have to tell you, it's always easier for me to worship in another church. Now, that has nothing to do with Craig or Deb or anybody that's leading. It has nothing to do with any of you. It has everything to do with me. Why is it possibly easier for me to worship in another church? Because I'm only thinking about the Lord. I'm not thinking about making sure everything goes tickety-boo. Now, whose fault's that? It's mine. Why? Because I live into a different story at times. I get stuck. Believing that somehow if we do everything right, somehow it's better. This is the point, I think, that's being made here in Genesis chapter 4. When we walk in the way of Abel, we learn that it's trusting in him. It's about him and for him. Not about us. Friends, is it possible that the way we worship is indicative of the story that we live in? Yeah, but I just don't like the songs you sang this morning. Guess what story you're living in? Yeah, but I just didn't get fed by the sermon. Yeah, but I've had a hard week and I feel really tired and is it possible that the way that we worship is indicative of the story we live in? Well, there's more. There's more to this incredible story of Cain and Abel. Come with me to the second part of verse 5, and let me read a little bit further. It said, 
So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. God had chosen Abel's sacrifice, Abel's worship, and not his. Then the Lord comes and says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Notice what happens to Cain after he realizes that he's worshiping in a faulty way. Or at least his worship isn't all that it could be. It says that he gets angry and becomes depressed or that his countenance falls. I'm not sure how he knew that God had rejected his and sort of accepted Abel's. Some speculate that God may still have been talking to human beings face to face at the edge of the garden, but doesn't tell us that in the text, so I'm not going to go with that. But all of a sudden, this conversation happens between God and Cain. So far, we've seen that Cain has lived into a different story. He's not worshipped in a way that gives honor to God, and his countenance has fallen. He's become angry. And God comes to him in the midst of that, and he says, well, Cain, I want to have a conversation. Don't you know that if you do what's right, you'll be accepted? And don't you know that if you don't do what's right, you do something that's wrong, you're putting yourself in harm's way. Sin is crouching at your door. Now, in those days, the word they used for sin uh, really depicted a demon, It's as if when you do the wrong things, when you worship in the wrong way and you put yourself in that spot, there's there's a temptation, a demon that comes along and causes you to think through what you'll do next. What do we glean for us? It's amazing how patient God is. Even when Cain is not worshiping properly, God is still merciful to him. He still communicates. Even when Cain is angry and gets depressed, it doesn't seem like he's still crossed the line of sin. He's just put himself in a place of decision. Will I walk back towards God, doing the right thing, or will I walk away from him? I wonder if it's possible That for us, living in the wrong story, where we depend on ourselves instead of depending on God, leads to faulty worship. And where our faulty worship leads to a soured demeanor. And where our soured demeanor leaves us at this point of decision, a crossroads, will we walk towards God or walk away from Him? Pick up the story again in verse 8. Let's see what happens next. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Stop there. What's going on inside of Cain? He hasn't worshipped properly. He's angry. He's down. And all of a sudden, in the midst of that mood, he begins to plot. Isn't that true that that happens to us all the time? When there's something that's gone on and we don't know how to make things right, our brains start ticking over trying to figure out, how do I put this right? And so often our brains begin to plot the next steps. Then he takes action. And his action is away from God instead of towards him. He carries out his plan that he's been plotting and he kills his brother Abel. And God comes on the scene again. Where's Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? It's one of the worst comments that we could hear. See, in chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned, and they sinned because they wanted to be like God. They wanted to know all things. But isn't it ironic that by chapter 4, human beings want to know nothing? 
Am I my brother's keeper? What's broken with that sentence? He just murdered his brother. It's the first time in scripture where we see the failure of the family, the loss of the family. But much deeper than that, it's the loss of community. For when we live into God's story, we know that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are living together in community for all time. And they invite us when they create us. They invite us as human beings into relationship there. And what Cain has said in the midst of that is, I don't belong to that story. And I don't care about that story. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. In God's story, you belong. When you make a statement that says it's not my business, you confess to the reality that you're living into the wrong story. Where did it unravel for Cain? With his action of killing Abel? Or before? When he was plotting? Or before? When he got angry? Or before? When there was faulty worship? Or even before, when he chose to live into the wrong story. Go a little bit further in the story. Here the Lord says, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and are driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its props for you. You'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. Friends, there are consequences to our sin. God's mercy is there, and we're talking about God's mercy now. But you have to understand, God's mercy does not always erase the consequences when we choose to go our own way. And for Cain, the consequences were hardship in the land, restless wandering. Oh, and it gets worse. Look at verse 13. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear Today you are driving me from the land. I'll be hidden from your presence. Oh, it's one thing that the land won't produce after he works hard. It's another thing that he's kicked out of his homeland and forced to wander. But worse, I'll be hidden from your presence. There are consequences when we choose to go our own way. And even yet, God's mercy reigns, and he protects Cain. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain, verse 15, will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence, lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. What's the practical implication for us here? The downside is there's times when we don't even see our sin. We don't even see this process. We don't even see that we're walking in the way of Cain. And then, like Cain, we fail to take ownership. We live in denial. In chapter 3, Adam and Eve blamed each other and blamed the servant. In chapter 4, there's denial that's there. What? Who, me? Am I my brother's keeper? Friends, sometimes we sweep things under the carpet, hope to avoid all of the consequences that will come, but I promise they'll come in one way or another. We cannot, we cannot act in this way and not either practically suffer the consequences or internally suffer the consequences, no matter how much we want them to go away. What's missing? What's missing in this story in in Genesis chapter 4? Repentance. There is none. How do we talk about the way of Cain and yet have hope? Well, this is not in this text, but it's certainly in Scripture. As we close, can I give you a couple of hints along the way? Do you see the downward trend of what happened in Cain's life? He lived in the wrong story. He worshipped in a faulty way. He ends up getting angry and his countenance goes down. He plots. 
He takes action. He denies that action. That's the way of Cain. But the way of Jesus is 180 degrees the other way. It's the word metanoia, which means repentance. It means that we turn. Instead of walking in the way of Cain, we stop and we turn and we face a new direction. We face the direction that God's invited us into in his story from day one. And we begin to take steps. Step number one, we take ownership. We accept responsibility for the sin that we've done. Without accepting responsibility, we can't take steps forward. I know how easy it is to say sorry because we got caught and we want the consequences to go away. But repentance is so much deeper. It's owning our own behavior. Recognizing that we're in need. We can't do it ourselves. We take another step. After we've taken ownership, we begin to change our actions. Sometimes people repent and nothing changes. It's not real repentance. Repentance means that we take ownership and then we take steps towards changing our actions. Not Frank Sinatra, I did it my way, but Jesus did it the Father's way. Tell me when you've ever, ever, ever obeyed God and regretted obeying him. Oh, sure, in the moment, there are times when we think, well, I don't really want to do that. I don't get it, and it won't, sort of the short-term circumstances won't help me. But tell me a time that you've ever obeyed God and later said, I shouldn't have done that. We take ownership, we act. Step three, our attitudes begin to shift. When you obey the Father, watch what begins to happen Anger is replaced with joy. Depression is replaced with receiving mercy. We take the fourth step after our attitudes begin to change and our worship begins to change. And we don't just do it out of religious duty. We come and we can't help it but fall on our knees and come before him and say, I trust you, I have faith in you because it's what you've done for me, not what I've done. And do you hear what just happened? The story we live into just changed. From I trust me, do I trust you? And I walk in a direction not that's good for my benefit, not that gives me glory, but that gives you glory. Genesis chapter 1 through 11. Two stories. The way of Cain and the way of the Father. We all have choices. Bow with me for a word of prayer and I'm going to invite us into communion.